Good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I am Lynn Fordham, and I am at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and am res representing the Society of Pediatric Radiology. So I've been given a huge task this morning to talk about abdominal ultrasound in the pediatric patient. And so there are a lot of things that we can think about, but what I'm going to try to do is talk about some of the common things um, that lead to emergent ultrasound exams, um, to talk about the role of ultrasound first um, as a final diagnosis, and then in the planning prior to a CT scan. Hopefully, we'll do it before rather than after the CT scan or MRI. So why ultrasound? I think many of our speakers have spoken on this. Um, it decreases exposure to radiation. It's inexpensive. Doesn't, in the pediatric patient, usually require sedation. And for CT and MR in young children, we do need to have sedation many times. And it can be a very important and final tool in answering uh, significant questions. So what I'm going to focus on this morning is talking about the infant with vomiting and the child with abdominal pain, two very common scenarios. So what are the things we think about? Well, um, the first is um, pyloric stenosis, if you have an infant who has projectile vomiting. Other things that might give you um, a vomiting but could also lead to pain, intussusception, and then appendicitis gives you pain, and abdominal masses can go a lot of different ways. So the child with vomiting, we're going to be thinking pyloric stenosis. You might want to worry about malrotation with volvulus if they have bilious emesis. Other things give you vomiting in a child, small bowel obstruction, gastroenteritis. So you need to recognize these things um, as important things in the differential. So pyloric stenosis, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, the pylorus is a specific part at the end of the stomach. Um, and what happens is the muscle of that part of the stomach, for reasons that no one really knows, becomes thickened and then over time can obstruct the stomach. Um, it's seen in firstborn boys. Um, babies whose parents had pyloric stenosis are more likely to get pyloric stenosis. Um, and there is a slight increased incidence of malrotation in these kids, so you need to be looking for that uh, evidence of that as well. And pyloric stenosis is actually pretty common, um, so it's an important differential. So who do we see this in? Um, usually it's in babies that are about a month old. Um, a friend of mine talks about the Gerber baby um, as being the pyloric stenosis um, baby. They have projectile vomiting. They may be losing weight. They may be acting hungry. Um, they could be dehydrated and lethargic. Um, clinical symptoms, they're great, but usually the patients had symptoms for, and pyloric stenosis for a while before these present with this wave-like motion of the anterior abdominal wall and a palpable mass in the abdomen. These days, we're able to see it, that um, finding much more quickly with ultrasound. So how do we do this? We roll the patient in an LPO position. Um, we get baseline images and measure the pylorus. We give the child Pedialyte. We get postprandial measurements. We look at the SMA and SMV for signs of malrotation. We check the kidneys quickly. Um, and we want to be looking for some of these pitfalls of imaging, pylorospasm, and then um, are we actually not looking at the pylorus at all? So here's an example of a positive study. Um, this is after the baby's been given Pedialyte. You can see all this bubbly material is fluid in the stomach. And what we're seeing is a beautiful gastric wall here, which transitions into a thickened abnormal, echogenic, elongated pylorus here. All this is thickened, um, measuring more than three millimeters. The channel length in this baby was measuring almost um, 19 millimeters, and so that is too long. And after feeding, we saw almost nothing going through the pylorus. So a positive study. Here's a couple of different examples of a negative exam. So we see the nice normal stomach here, nice normal wall, and a uh, short channel measuring around a centimeter. Here with um, Pedialyte, we can see that channel opens up nicely, and we have fluid flowing through, so a nice normal exam, very reassuring. When I was first in training, we used to do upper GI series for these, which are terrible exams for this, this pathology. Now, we don't think twice. We completely trust a positive study or negative study because we know it's very, very accurate. You want to be careful. You don't want to get images of the esophagus, which is what we're seeing here. It's sort of in the same region, and um, early on, people sometimes got this confused. Um, we want to be looking for this other entity, which is um, very significant, not nearly as common. It's an um, abnormal fixation of bowel in the fetal period. Generally, we're going to evaluate these with an upper GI series even today. Um, 
it's not generally thought to be the primary modality. Um, sometimes there can be some confusion clinically between pyloric stenosis and malrotation with volvulus. Um, not usually, but sometimes there can be some confusion. Um, and ultrasound, I think, is going to become more and more helpful in this entity. So I think this is an emerging indication um, that has been reported in the literature. We're going to be wanting to look at the position of the duodenum. We're going to be wanting to look at the position of the superior mesenteric artery and vein um, to look for signs of malrotation and then the secondary midgut volvulus. This is an example of a normal superior mesenteric artery and vein. We're looking at those vascular positions on this transverse image through the upper abdomen. Here on this positive study, we see that the position of the SMA and SMB is reversed. And then we have a swirl of echogenic mesentery, which is the volvulus part of the malrotation and volvulus. Abdominal pain can be a lot of things in kids. It can be a lot of things in adults, too, obviously. Um, I'm going to focus on intussusception and appendicitis, and then just a moment on masses. But there are a lot of other things that go into that differential. Intussusception, for those that don't know what that is, is when the bowel kind of folds in on itself. Um, it can be small bowel, small bowel intussusception, small bowel into large bowel, or large bowel, large bowel. Um, it can be, um, in most Commonly in the pediatric patient, it's going to be idiopathic, but there can be various pathologic lead points. The typical baby is going to be six months to four years old and a peak in that um, late in the first year of life. So different types um, give you different um, outcomes. Um, the small bowel, small bowel interceptions frequently will spontaneously resolve on their own. Um, you want to uh, find these early because they, um, if they don't resolve, you can get ischemia and necrosis of the bowel um, and can be uh, fatal, actually. Um, many times what we'll do these days is if we think that's an interception, we get an ultrasound. The data is very, very good um, for, again, a positive study being positive, a negative study being negative. Um, and it's something that, that, again, has been a huge paradigm shift through my training where initially we would do an enema for this um, indication and now we do ultrasound. Um, we um, are also transitioning. One of the um, sound judgment papers talks about using um, fluid to do the intussusception reduction and under ultrasound guidance rather than fluoroscopy. So we're going to be seeing some uh, transition to that um, in our country as well. So how do these babies present? paroxysmal abdominal pain, vomiting diarrhea in the current jelly stool, which I won't show you a picture of. Um, um, they may, on physical exam, have abnormal bowel sounds and abdominal mass. Um, clinical diagnosis, again, you can find papers that say a lot of different things. I think our clinicians are maybe a little better than this, but that was one um, finding. So on a diagram, here we have the colon, and then this is showing an ileo colic intussusception. This is the ileum, the last part of the small bowel is going backwards up into the colon. Here's a kind of blown up view of that same thing. And again, this is relatively common pediatric problem. We want to use a linear transducer. We look for these target signs and pseudo kidney signs. We want to look for a mass that's more than three centimeters to look for that small bowel, large bowel, um, ileocolic intussusception. We have to be aware of possible lead points, a Meckel's diverticulum or a duplication cyst or other pathologic masses. So here's an example of an idiopathic ileocolic intussusception. Here's that target sign here. Again, a target sign here in the right upper quadrant. Um, as we looked around in the belly, we see evidence of a small bowel obstruction with dilated fluid-filled bowel loops. And the same thing up over in here. A Meckel's diverticulum is a congenital anomaly, which um, is a um, sometimes a benign thing that um, doesn't bother the patient any time during their life, um, but it can lead to a variety of different conditions, one of them being a um, pathologic intussusception. So here's an example here. Again, we see that pseudo kidney target sign appearance, that all those lamellated walls and the echogenic mesentery. And in the middle is a Meckel's diverticulum that was acting as a lead point for this bowel to intussuscept on itself. So transitioning now to belly pain, um, appendicitis is the most common condition requiring surgery in pediatrics. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the literature about ultrasound versus CT versus CT versus ultrasound. I think ultrasound is fabulous. This is the way we always started our institution now. Um, 
the appendix in appendicitis becomes inflamed and ischemic and can perforate. And again, we're seeing this in the school age child. Same type of line drawing. Here's the appendix. The um, appendix in this beautiful drawing, as many of you know, is coming off the end of the cecum and extending over the psoas muscles and the iliac vessels, and that would be an easy one to find. Unfortunately, it can go behind the cecum, it can go up into the midline, it can be long, it can be short, it can be a very challenging um, procedure, but when it's positive, it's extremely helpful, and when you see secondary signs, it's extremely helpful, and you can be comforted that if you don't see anything bad, it's probably gonna be fine. So what are we looking for? Tube stape structure, one to two centimeters below the ileocecal valve. We wanna see it being six millimeters or less in size. Appendicitis symptoms, fever, white count, pain, possibly vomiting, treated with surgery generally, um, and then antibiotics. We want to use um, a linear transducer generally, um, using the, the well-published um, techniques. We need to have a variety of transducers available to us because some of the patients, some of our little kitties, we're going to use something as small as an 18-15 linear, the larger kids maybe a 9 linear, and then the larger children, we might even have to go up to a, fir a 4 um, curve transducer because they're big kids um, and they may be obese children. We tend to start at the area of most um, obvious tenderness and then look all over the place. Um, things we look for, that blind ending structure in the right lower quadrant, greater than six millimeters, supposedly a um, sensitivity of 98%. We look for hypervascular flow. We look for inflammatory changes in the fat nearby. Look for free fluid and the appendicolith, which may lead to a higher risk of perforation. So with problems, even in the pediatric population, some of our kids are obese. Um, sometimes the area of pathology is obscured by overlying bowel gas. Um, sometimes there can be other inflammatory processes going on um, that make it more difficult for us to uh, see the appendix and determine whether it's positive or negative. Um, sometimes our children are just too uncomfortable for us to really get a good compression exam. Um, and then once in a while we make mistakes and we think that um, what we thought was a appendix actually turns out to be a bowel loop or a lymph node or Meckel's diverticulum. Lots of things in the differential to think about in a kid who might have appendicitis. Lots of kids are constipated, ovarian things, a lot of other things on that list as well. Um, so what does the normal look like? Here we see a beautiful, normal, blind ending tubular structure, normal lamellated wall, normal lumen, normal measurements at five millimeters. The surrounding um, fat is nice and normal, no increased echogenicity we see here in the transverse. And you wanna scan both in long and trans and scan all the way down to the end to make sure you get down to the tip of that bowel. Um, early appendicitis here, you can see this wall is thickened. We're beginning to lose that lamellated structure. Um, again, proving that with compression, there's no change in the size, and this is measuring greater than six millimeters and was right where the patient was tender. The uh, surrounding tissues are relatively normal. This is a um, more advanced or um, different patient where we have the appendix here, and we have an echogenic structure, lots of shadowing, and this is an appendicolith in the appendix. Another big appendicolith. Um, this is an appendix where we don't see the appendix wall very well, but lots and lots of echogenic fat around this area. So we do see this enlarged appendix. We've lost the normal um, wall lamellation, and so we're concerned that this is much more of a ischemic process getting ready to perforate. Here is a perforated appendicitis, lots of echogenic inflammatory fat, areas of fluid. Um, and just finally, um, abdominal mass is another possibility um, that you might consider in a baby or a child with abdominal pain. It may be a palpable mass. I find ultrasound very useful to look at the organ of origin, um, to look for secondary findings, and I think it's really, really helpful in um, deciding how we're gonna proceed further with a more expensive study that requires sedation. So for example, here, there's a large heterogeneous mass that's kind of tucked up behind the liver on this transverse view. Here's a longitudinal view. We're thinking this is coming from the kidney. The ultrasound showed the thrombus in the IBC, so this is probably gonna be a Wilms tumor with an IBC thrombus, but this will help us decide whether we're gonna do CT or MR and how we're gonna set it up. 
So in summary, I've tried to look at some of the common applications in pediatric abdominal ultrasound. We've talked about pyloric stenosis. We've talked a little bit about intussusception, appendicitis, and then very briefly about masses. And ultrasound is really the only test required in pyloric stenosis, in intussusception, many times in appendicitis, almost never in a mass. But I think it's the first way to go in all these modalities and is a very um, useful way to spend your time and money. Um, it's important to use meticulous technique and to be knowledgeable of some of the other possibilities you might see on the ultrasound exam. Thank you.